Um, welcome to Dining with the Diva. Uh, today I've decided we're going to make a little um, a Sicilian recipe. I usually go to Sicily oh, probably about three or four times a year and I've been going for about, uh, about eight years now. Um, I love Sicily because to me it's a combination of some of the places I love most. Uh, I love Italy, of course. Hi, Amy. Um, I love Italy, and I love, I used to go to Mexico a lot, and I love oh, Greece. Yeah. I lived in Greece for about four months in um, 1978. Um, I thought I was going to stay there. Hi, Robin. And uh, when I got to Sicily, I was really surprised that it was, that they had been ruled by like 15 different countries, and so all those countries left something in Sicily. So, um, ciao Holly, hi Francesca. Um, there's a little bit of uh, Spain, so that's Mexico for me, the New World Foods that were brought over. Ciao Daniele. Uh, the New World Foods that were brought over, so there's chocolate in Modica, uh, made the same way they make it in Oaxaca. There's um, couscous from the Arab countries, which is really nice. The Greek ruins, some of the best Greek ruins are in Sicily, which is really nice. Um, they had the French Monsou uh, in the 18th century. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Gato Bardo. There was a, uh, all the rich, wealthy, noble families had uh, French chefs. So they had the French cuisine, the Spanish cuisine. They had um, the New World products were brought there. So it, it's fascinating. It's, um, I really love it. So today I was going to make, uh, my husband asked if we could have fish. And Monday isn't usually a very good fish day, but there's always some fish that's always fabulous, like swordfish. And swordfish, to me, is the fish for people that don't like fish. It's a very meaty fish. It's, it doesn't have bones. And we buy it in these uh, really nice little steaks. Let me show you just how thin this is. Okay. So it's not very big. It's a beautiful, lean, white meat. And this recipe is just going to take so few minutes to make. It's a... Uh, Great for parties, great for last minute, no stress cooking. <laughs> the only thing is you need pans big enough. So this one happens to fit these two huge big steaks. You don't preheat anything. Okay, this recipe is from Trapani, from my friend Pino Majori, who's the chef at the Cantina Siciliano in Trapani. It's over in the old, old quarter of Sicily. So <clears throat> we just simply extra virgin olive oil, drizzle it with extra virgin olive oil, and always be generous with your olive oil. It's really, there's so few ingredients in these dishes. It's, it's part of the flavor and part of the sauce. A nice splash of white wine. And I happen to have Planeta, which is where I stay when I go down to Memphi. Uh, Planeta wine. Just a nice big splash of that too. <clears throat> the moisture and kind of like considered a broth for cooking. So just a nice light white wine. Cherry tomatoes cut in half. Today I got these, and, and at my grocery store they had the little Sicilian ones, because in Tuscany it's too early for tomatoes. So just kind of cover this with, <coughs> with the tomatoes. This is called a swordfish a la pantesca, and um, it's named for Pan the island of Pantelidia, where most of the capers come from. And I'll be showing you in a video pretty soon where capers come from. They grow on plants, and they're they're, fr they're flower buds, and they're preserved. These are in vinegar. Um, I usually prefer those in salt, because then that's my salt when I'm cooking. Ciao, Gaia. Hi, Don. So, um, capers are the main ingredient, and that's what the people from the island of Pantelleria would use. <coughs> it's um, a beautiful island, um, and they make beautiful dessert wines. So if you ever see any wines from Pantelleria, add those. And so I'm going to add now just pine nuts. So, cherry tomatoes, capers, pine nuts. Okay. And then the secret ingredient, which I think you're going to love, the other thing that comes from Sicily is almonds. So, ground almond flour. Normally, people would flour a fish fillet and then fry it and then do all these other things. Well, this one, we're just going to sprinkle a nice amount of uh, almond flour all over this. Maybe like a quarter cup or a little bit more. That's going to... Uh, thicken the sauce and make like a creamy kind of sauce with no cream and with no flour. So this is good for gluten-free people. I'm just cranking the heat up here now. I like to add a little of uh, Sicilian oregano also because I love oregano. 
So everything goes on at the beginning. I'm going to also add a little salt. Sicilian oregano is really kind of sweet. It's like the Greek oregano, which I really love, and uh, sea salt, which is also Sicilian. Okay, I didn't have the salted capers. So I can be a little generous on that. I'm just going to rinse my hand off for a second here. <clears throat> I think it's funny, well, not real funny, but kind of funny, how Sicilian my kitchen is anyway. Um, I love so many of the ingredients that come from there. Okay, so all we have to do now is um, wait till this heats up, and we're just going to flip it once, and what I look for basically is that these little tomatoes break down, okay? I'm just going to push them off the swordfish here a little bit into the, the saucepan, and then I'll be able to flip the fish easier too. Um, there's a similar recipe that's um, simple that was uh, the pesce in aqua pazza that they do in Naples, and <clears throat> that one they do in the oven. And the same thing, they throw the cherry tomatoes, sometimes mussels, around the fish with olive oil, splash of white wine, and oven roast it. Oops. And um, this is already starting to boil now. Swordfish, because it's, it's cut so thin, will uh, cook really quickly. Let me get my spatula out. And so also then the heat and the wine will blend with the almond flour and make a beautiful, beautiful sauce. When you're <coughs> actually cooking fish, it's so easy. You can watch it cook because it'll start at the bottom and it'll start to turn white. From being the pale pink color that the swordfish was, it'll actually start to turn white. It's starting to boil now. This is an oval pan, so I'm just going to keep <coughs> turning it a little bit to move the heat. It tends to be hotter just in the middle there. Okay. Just making sure it's not sticking. Remember, I didn't have any oil in the pan or anything. This is just such a great recipe. <clears throat> Pino has a couple of really special recipes. When you go to Trapani, um, hi Anne. Uh, when you go to Trapani. It's on the west coast of Sicily, and it's where you get the ferry boats to go to the islands like Favignano, <clears throat> which is where like all the tuna factories were. And in Trapani, they're famous, from like Marsala up to Trapani on that west coast, they're famous for their couscous, and it's called couscousou, is the word they use, and it's uh, only fish couscous. So it's not the Moroccan or Tunisian couscous, which is a dish which has six million variations. It's only the fish. And... Um, I learned from Pino uh, how to make my own couscous, how to roll my own couscous. So there's a special uh, grain of semola, which is ground kind of rough, and you have these big plates, and you throw water on it, and then with your fingers you move it around, and you toss it and rub it, toss it and rub it, and you form your own couscous kernels, and then you steam those. So it's an act of love. <coughs> you steam them, and that takes like about two hours for them to steam. In the meantime, you make this beautiful fish soup. And then you um, flavor the couscous with some of the broth from the fish soup. And then you strain out all the fish and bones. And then you cook other pieces of fish, which will then be served on top of the couscous. So Pino's is one of the places that I would suggest to go to have fish couscous. The other dish I really love that he makes is a busiate, which is a hand-rolled, um, like a, a fusilli, a spaghetti. And I want to show you how to make this flour and water pasta, which I really love. Um, and he does it with the pesto trapanese. So pesto from trapani is made with uh, tomatoes, almonds, basil. So it's a, a beautiful sauce. And then he puts um, eggplant on his, grilled eggplant. So can you hear this? It's uh, bubbling away. Oh, I'm hungry too. I'm smelling it. It's making me crazy. So I'm just going to now flip my swordfish. So Gaia is my Google master. I took some SEO classes from her, and she was picked by Google to help um, Florentine businesses learn how to use the internet. So already, this is soaking up, because of that um, almond flour, this is already soaking up my wine. So I'm going to add a little more olive oil here and a little more wine, just to be sure it doesn't dry out. And this is going to create my beautiful sauce. 
you never really know how much the flour is going to absorb here. Hi, Jonathan. Another chef friend checking in from New York. Jonathan, I'll see you next February. Coming to New York with IACP for my culinary conference. Okay, I'm just moving this all around. So it's um, whenever you make like a sauce with flour, you need to mix it up a little bit so that it blends and thickens. Kind of you know, like bechamel sauce. One of my friends was saying, "Why don't you show us how to make bechamel sauce?" White sauce is one of the basic sauces of life. Okay, so now what I'm watching to do. Um, do you know the trick about when things are cooked? When you press on your hand here, it's for steak and things, and it's kind of mushy, that's raw, and if you close it, that's medium, and if you put it hard, that's well done. So you don't actually need to cut into meat or fish to know if it's done. You can just press on it with the back of a fork, and if you start doing that, like when it's raw, you'll feel how it changes when it gets to be well done. So I can feel this is, this is nice and firm, but now what I'm doing is I'm waiting for my tomatoes to break down. And just because, I'm just going to flip this one more time to make sure the sauce underneath is done. Mmm, looks good. This sauce is just so incredible. I don't usually eat a lot of bread, but this makes me eat bread, too. I've seen some people, when they make this sauce, they kind of make it like um, what a fresh puttanesca would be. And they like to add black olives. Uh, the black olives um, in Italy are really kind of strong. Um, I love them, but a lot of people don't like strong olives, so this to me is the, the kind of safe way to make it. But you can always uh, dress it up or down. Have you ever had the puttanesca pasta sauce? Garlic, anchovies, black olives, tomatoes, capers. It's really, really good. <coughs> um, it was supposed to be the ladies of the night, the puttane, the puttanesca. It was supposed to be that late night pasta when they needed a little pick-me-up. Okay. I've also seen other recipes too where they do just uh, um, flour and fry the fish first and then they cook it with a little sauce afterwards. This is almost done. I'm just waiting for these tomatoes. So really it's um, like a 10 to 15 minute recipe. And on the side, um, I didn't do this live, but I did a little uh, film clip. I'm making just simple boiled potatoes because I love potatoes with sauce. So I put a little on my YouTube channel, I did a little thing on how Tuscans cook potatoes. So <coughs> we um, put potatoes in cold water and then add a lot of sea salt, cover them and boil until they're done. I do it with the skin on and then you just cook them until the knife goes right in there. Okay. So those are done. I can turn those off now. And boiled potatoes, they're just so yummy on their own. They don't tend to make, um, like, potato salad. Potato salad uh, would have mayonnaise and things like that. So what we tend to do is just dress it with olive oil and vinegar. I don't know if you remember the Marcella Hassan recipe where she, uh, when the potatoes come out, you peel them, cut them into chunks, and then splash them with vinegar. And then the vinegar soaks into potatoes, makes it nice and tart, and then you dress them with oil instead of the potatoes absorbing the oil. Well, we have, I wanted to show you so many great vinegars here. I have, um, this is my grocery store one, which I love, which is called, you know, just a, a commercial brand. It's called Antica Roma. And it's, um, it's a white wine vinegar. Let me see how much acidity it has in it. Um, but I love Italian vinegars. I was never really fond of American ones. Does this say what the acid level? 7.1 acidity level. And it's aged in wood, so it has a nice kind of a round flavor. <laughs> in America, <coughs> I really love the, uh, I love apple cider vinegar. I think that's one of our better vinegars more than the crappy cheap wine vinegars. This is a winery vinegar, which uh, wine should not turn to vinegar, but sometimes this is actually made from Vin Santo, which is their dirt, uh, dessert wine. So they took some of the grapes that they're going to make the dessert wine with and they aged them in oak. So that's what I said. This is only 6% acidity. And then my friend, um, remember my friend uh, Andrea Bezzecchi who makes the, my nice balsamic vinegar here? Well, he also makes other vinegars. He makes beer vinegars. He's making apple vinegar. 
And this one is a new wine vinegar. He's aging in the clay pots, like the antique way of making uh, wine. And this is really nice too. So this is from the Gar Garganega wine, wine grape. It's not diluted. It spontaneously acidifies. And it's done in the, the terracotta pots from Georgia. Uh, not filtered, not pasteurized. So this is really, really fabulous. And this is 8.6% uh, alcohol. And then, <clears throat> like if I'm doing something a little different, this is from another winery nearby where my girlfriend works that produces a rose syrup. And this is a, a rose vinegar with a red wine vinegar and rose petals. So that's unusual. So I'd like to infuse and make my own uh, vinegars too. Um, I was watching my girlfriend Kate Hill today and she was in her garden and she just started doing Facebook Live. And she was gathering like chive blossoms, oregano blossoms, and she was making an herb infused oil. What I'm going to do with my blossoms is I'm going to make the infused vinegars because I like the vinegars, like I was saying, on my potatoes and stuff like that. Let me show you what the fish looks like. It's done. That was it. It smells so good, the oregano. So these are these beautiful steaks. Okay. I'm just going to add a little more liquid to get this to be a little saucier because the, the almonds really absorbed a lot. If you don't want to keep adding wine to it, you can just add water. And a little liquid after you do something in the pot is really nice too to what's called deglazing your pot. And you can scrape up any of those little bits that stick to the bottom. And that really makes the sauce lovely. So this is really, really beautiful. I'm going to spoon, sauce spoon here. Turn it off. And you'll see how beautiful this is. Colorful, flavorful. And for us, we really love the sauce, so we just like serving serve this with a ton of bread. So here you go. Swordfish Pantesca. Hi, Mary James. See you soon. With um, capers, pine nuts, cherry tomatoes, oregano, and almond flour. Enjoy it. I'll put this on, uh, on YouTube for you, and uh, I'll link to the recipe, which is uh, already on my website, because I've already made this before and posted it, and then if you go also to the um, YouTube channel, you'll see the, uh, I'm starting to add some other little videos that I've got made too. Hi Robin. Yeah, it's this is totally worth making. It's so, so good. Okay, I have a, um, a class I'm going to take online in about 15 minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Hi Jonathan. Oh, good. That'd be dinners. Well, if you guys make this, um, post it. on the. Are you all with the Dining on the Diva page? Join the Dining with the Diva page, and we're going to share um, share our presentations, share recipes, share questions about, about the food and everything. Thanks, Robin. That was very nice. And, um, and then I'm thinking this weekend, tomorrow's a holiday here, so I'm going to go work with my, with my butcher friend, Dario. It gets kind of crazy on the holidays here. <coughs> go help him in the butcher shop and then I was thinking Saturday I'm going to make the gluten free cake and that again is using ground almond flour so if you get ground almond flour it's um, it's a beautiful cake and I made it with um, I've done I do several versions of almond cakes uh, I love almond cakes anyway I love hazelnut flour we can get pistachio flour hazelnut walnut and almond um, and it's used quite a bit, even when I did French cooking, they call it a biscuit, a very thin, dense dough that's often used in layering of dessert, uh, layered presentations of cakes and desserts. But, um, <clears throat> did you ever see the film, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Uh, they had a beautiful orange flower cake, which is, uh, you grind oranges, you boil oranges and grind them and blend that in there. And so, um, I've done that and I've done one with lemon flour. The people from Naples do one with melted chocolate. 
I've done it. <coughs> the old recipe I had, I ground chocolate bars with whole almonds and made almond flour with chocolate, and that comes out more chocolate chippy. So I just keep adding new versions. And the one I did the other day was a lemon zest lemon juice. And I'm sure you could add lemon cello if you wanted to. And I've had a white chocolate uh, almond cake. So but I, the white chocolate to me tends to be a little bit too sweet. So, um, so I think Saturday about the same time we'll do the, uh, I'll do the lemon almond cake. My husband loved it so much. There were like no leftovers. I think I'm going to make double this time. Hi, Judy. Okay. Ciao. Ciao, you guys. I'll see you later. The, yeah, I've got the recipe online, so I'll tag it for you, Judy. It's so easy to make. Ciao.